He is faithful. He is true. He is mighty. And he will roll some bow for him and praise his name. My Jesus Christ forever reigns. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. He is faithful and He is true. He is mighty and He will rule so bow for Him and praise His name. My Jesus Christ forever reigns. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. 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 Good morning. We now have our prayer. Let's pray. Father God, we, we love you, and what a privilege, what an honor it is to be in your house this morning, to be in the presence of the one true living and awesome God that we've just been singing about. Father, our prayer this morning is that we can push everything else out of our out of our mind out of our thoughts and whatever is clouding us whatever you know satan may be trying to fill our our head with other thoughts father we pray that we can just truly focus on you and worship you um being here this morning this is why we've been created to praise you and Father, we are just grateful for the opportunity to be in your house today. Father, we, we do come before you um, as a group of people who have sinned. And Father, this morning we want to ask for your forgiveness. Father, we know that there's many um, here at Highway who are not able to be with us because of sickness. And Father, we want to lift those individuals up to you, those different situations before you're thrown now. And we, we ask that you place your healing hand upon them. May we reach out to those that we know who are struggling and may we be an encouragement to them. Help us to do that. Father, what an exciting week we have coming up. Um, all over um, many schools are starting back and, and Father we just want to lift lift up the teachers and the students uh, we pray for those anxious parents um, and those anxious uh, folks working at the school and, and anxious students and Father we just pray for safety we pray for um, the leadership and those making decisions And Father, we just, we thank you for the opportunity to have school and the opportunity to learn and, and, and to grow. Father, most importantly, we strive this morning to do your will, to use the gifts and talents that you've blessed us with to, to spread the good news, to further your kingdom, 
and to be a light in this world that sometimes seems to be getting darker and darker. Father, may we no longer hide our lights. May we, um, may we be that city on a hill. Lord, we thank you for hearing our, our prayer this morning. We thank you for hearing our cries. We love you, and we can't say it enough. Thank you for Jesus and the sacrifice he made for us. May we never forget. It's through him that we pray. Amen. I was lost in sin, but Jesus took me. Well, in the life from heaven filled my soul. Well, it made my heart in love and wrote my name above. And just a little talk with Jesus' face, Lord, now let us have a little talk with. Won't you let us sail in? I know He will hear. And I know he'll answer Now we feel As you want So when you, you will find A little talk with Jesus Makes it right Well, I may have doubts and fears My eyes be filled with tears But Jesus is a friend Who watches day and night Well I can go to him in prayer He knows my every care And just a little talk with Jesus makes Lord, now let us have a little talk with Watch your land still I know he will hear And I know he'll answer Now we feel as you seated in Christ alone my hope is found he is my life my strength my song this cornerstone this solid ground firm through the fiercest trial and storm what heights of love what depths of peace when fears are stilled when striving cease my comforter my all in all here in the love of christ i stand in christ alone who took on flesh fullness of god in helpless faith this gift of love and righteousness scorned by the ones he came to save till on that cross as jesus died the For every sin on him was laid Here in the death of Christ I live There in the ground his body lay A light of the world by darkness flame then bursting forth in glorious day up from the grave he rose again and as he says in victory says curse has lost its grip on me for I am his and he Precious blood.
weapon of Christ. No guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first crime to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand until he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ I'll stand till he returns or calls me home here in the power of christ i'll stand you know god knew that we as human beings had a hard time remembering so from the very beginning God puts memorials out there for people to remember things about him. If you remember from the time the Israelites went from Egypt, there's been a reminder of a Passover feast ever since. There were many, many um, particular altars that were built for people to remember things. When I was growing up, I lived uh, in a household with three other siblings and it wasn't very hard for me to remember the fact that my dad had a birthday, my mom had a birthday, and my three siblings and I had birthdays. That was six to remember. And then uh, I got married and I added a wife's birthday to remember and her parents and brother. And then my siblings had uh, children and their children's uh, birthdays I had to start remembering. And then I had two children, one of which has a birthday today. Uh, so. Uh, I started having to remember birthdays, and then we had six grandchildren, and now I can't remember anything as I get older. Uh, but fortunately, I have a wife, and I have a calendar that helps me to remember those things. And we celebrate those days once a year with the people that we love. Isn't it great, the, the fact that we get to celebrate the fact that Jesus died and was raised and is alive today on a weekly basis? Unfortunately, there are people that try only do that once a year or once a quarter, but we have the privilege, and it is a privilege, to celebrate his death, burial, and resurrection on a weekly basis. And let's not take that for granted. Let's pray as we give thanks for the bread. Father, we come to you today thanking you for so many blessings you have given us in our lives. Father, the ultimate blessing, the chance for forgiveness of our sins and for salvation through your Son. We're thankful for his willingness to give up his life, that he could be that sacrifice once and for all. Father, we ask that as we partake of this bread, that we will remember and proclaim his death and his burial and his resurrection. Help us to be a light for you in all that we do. It's through him that we pray. Amen. And just like in the Old Testament sacrifices for sin, there had to be blood shed. And Jesus' blood was shed for us once and for all. Let's pray as we think of the blood before we partake of the fruit of the vine. Father, again, we come to you thanking you for that sacrifice of Jesus, his willingness to, to die for us, the blood that was shed for us. And Father, as we partake of this cup, that we will remember that sacrifice that he gave. This is our prayer through him. Amen. Let us all together stand.
Blessed be your name in a land that is plentiful, where streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place, though I walk through the wilderness. Blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glory. Name. Blessed be your name when the sun shining down on me, when the world's all as it should be. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name on a road marked with suffering, though there's pain in the offering. Blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. You give and take away. You give and take away. My heart will choose to say, Lord, blessed be your name. You give and take away. You give and take away. My heart will choose to say, Lord, blessed be your name. You give and take away. You give and take away. My heart will choose to say, Lord, blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name. And the church said, you may be seated. In a little bit, I'm going to say a prayer for the upcoming school year. And when I do, I'd like to ask the uh, students and uh, uh, faculty and staff members of our different institutions around here to please stand. Um, to our students, I, I know y'all are all ready to get back from our, or start from our kindergarten through our college kids. Um, it's gonna be a different year. Uh, uh, we just ask that y'all be smart about what you're doing, okay? Uh, be smart about who you're around and how you're around them. Our teachers, we just ask that you take a deep breath. Uh, I know, uh, I know I'm going to have to the first two weeks. I can automatically see it's just going to be a zoo and I'm going to have to live with it. Uh, and it, there's going to be a big learning curve out there for me, teaching a class live like this and also trying to do it virtual at the same time. So it's going to be different for me as well and all the other teachers. Um, to our staff members and administration who have been working real hard. Administration's been doing a lot of planning 
to get the schools going, to try to get the PPE they need and things like that, as well as the staff members, uh, our unsung heroes, getting it ready, actually doing the physical work on the ground. So there are going to be a lot of things that are different. And, uh, uh, you know, one of the prayers is I, I, I hope we don't have to go 100% virtual again. I uh, really didn't like that, and I don't know most, most kids and students don't like that as well either. Uh, one thing I've been prayerful thought about was the vaccine, have a working vaccine out there that would help us. And I know some of y'all are apprehensive about the vaccine, things like that. And I believe as American citizen that you're right. Um, but uh, I've been in the military before and I've got so many shots. Uh, you know, I, I don't, I've forgotten what they all were from every year, the flu shot to anthrax. And so yeah, I'm not real leery of vaccines uh, and some of you might be, but I do hope there is one coming out working soon that would settle a lot of this down. So anyway, I'm going to ask that all our students from uh, the youngest all the way through the oldest, uh, teachers, our administrators, our staff members at schools, would y'all please stand as I offer a blessing for the school year. Don't be bashful. If you're in school, stand up. Let's pray. Lord, there's a lot of apprehension, a lot of excitement out there as well for the upcoming school year. Lord, I ask that you protect this group from the virus that is going around. Lord, I ask that we be smart about what we do. Lord, I ask that uh, our teachers and administrators and staff not to get stressed out about the things going on. That we know that you can come overcome all things, Father. Father, I pray that we not have to go back to 100% virtual classes that we can stay here in our communities, in our school, that our college students get to stay, Lord, and get to be around each other and uplift each other again, Father. Father, we know that we can trust in you to accomplish all things, Lord. Lord, we pray for a working vaccine to be out soon to help with some of the anxieties that are out there, Father. Father, I ask a special blessing be upon this group before you standing today. Please put a hedge of protection around them. This I ask in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Last week we talked about Jesus, our great high priest, and how there's this theme through the book of Hebrews about uh, the shadow and the reality. That the Levitical high priesthood was, is just a shadow of the reality of the true mediator and high priest, Jesus Christ. Too often we uh, settle for the shade. We, we're okay with the shadow, that's enough. It's got similar contour, similar shape, and it's comfortable. Um, think about a tree. We like, we like the, the shade that a tree provides, but a tree can do a whole lot more than just provide shade. If you'll actually not just settle for the shadow of the tree, but go for what the tree itself will provide. As you climb those branches and take of that fruit, that tree itself gives itself for true shelter that you could build out of the lumber of that tree. Jesus is the true high priest, and he can truly help. I'll start with a kind of a parable. It's really, it really sounds like it's going to be a joke, but it's not. So uh, it's just kind of a little parable in the making. A man's walking along, and he falls into a terribly deep hole with sheer sides. He doesn't know what he's going to do. A guy walks by and he hollers, hey, help! And this man is a physician. He says, help me! The guy says, hey, I'm a, I'm a doctor. I can help. And so he writes a prescription and throws it down into the hole. Another guy walks by. It's a religious person. Hey, help! Religious person. The religious person writes a little prayer and throws it down in the hole. Another person walks by and it's a therapist. A therapist, yes. Help me, I'm down in this hole and I can't get out. What does it feel like to be down in that hole? I love therapists, you're good. There are limitations. Uh, so the therapist leaves. Finally comes a friend. The friend walks by and he says, friend, 
help me, I'm down in this hole. And the friend jumps in. Well, said, what are you doing? Now both of us are stuck. The friend says, uh, I, I've been down here before and I know the way out. The true friend can truly help. We have a merciful and gracious high priest who is truly able to help us in our time of need. Look at Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 through 16. It's a very well-known passage, maybe the most well-known passage of Hebrews, except for maybe Hebrews 12, 1 and 2, or Hebrews 11. This is an awesome passage that's, that's loaded with truth. Here it is. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. See if you hear these four themes. Kind of keep this, this passage in your heart. See if you hear these four themes. He is able to help us because he became what we are. He is able to help us because he didn't do what we did. He is able to help us because he didn't give us what we deserved. He is able to help us because he is what we will be. I'm going to give them to you one more time and see if you can see all of these themes here represented in this encouraging passage. He became what we are. He didn't do what we did. He didn't give us what we deserved. And he is what we will be. That's why the true high priest is really able to help. He's able to help because he became what we are. We've talked about this theme. You can't miss this theme in the book of Hebrews. He's able to empathize with us because he was tempted in every way. He endured suffering on our behalf. He gets it. He's with us. There's also this uh, theme that's a little more subtle in Hebrews that... <coughs> There's a good kind of pride. I know scripture rails against pride. It's the worst thing. But there's also a godly and beautiful kind of pride. Like the kind of pride you see on a daddy's face about his son. Like the kind of pride you have in your own family. There's a theme about that in the book of Hebrews and that is he is not ashamed to call us his brothers and sisters. He, Jesus, our great high priest and representative and brother is not ashamed to claim you as his brothers and sisters. Look at Hebrews chapter 2 verse 11. We'll start with verse 10. For it was fitting that he for whom and by whom all things exist in bringing many sons to glory should make the founder of their, their salvation perfect through suffering. So this is the Father making the Son perfect through suffering with us and for us. Verse 11, For he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one source. Jesus who sanctifies, we who are being sanctified have one Father. That is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers. Jesus, uh, who has gone through the heavens and at the right hand of the majesty on high, is claiming us and he's proud of us, his brothers and sisters. I talked with my oldest son. He's going to be getting married uh, this, this weekend in Chicago. We're going to be heading up there Wednesday. And... Uh, it was the most beautiful conversation. Just Amy and I laying on our bed. The conversation lasted about an hour and a half. And he'll do this from time to time. He just calls and we just talk and talk and talk. And he loves God so much. It hasn't always been that way. He initiates conversations about Christ. And he loves... Uh, his family and he loves his upbringing he loves what this church has installed in him and he went through a phase when there wasn't any of that 
It was beautiful to talk with him. And as I thought about this lesson, I thought about when he was a little boy. He's always been so brutally honest that it's uh, so honest. He doesn't know how to fake it, you know. And uh, when we were moving from Irving to, to here, it was 2001. And he loved his life in Irving. He loved his school. He loved his friends. He loved his church. And even though he was eight or nine, he did not want to be ripped up out of that city. And I was having this long talk with him, and he was not hearing it. He didn't like it at all. But by the time it was over, I, I just was so grateful for him for listening, even though he totally disagreed with this decision. And I said, Barrett, I'm proud of you. And he said, I'm pr and He couldn't finish it. <laughs> he knew that it was the right thing to say, I'm proud of you too, Dad. But he really wasn't. And he just had to stop himself before he told a lie. And we've laughed about that. And I'll still say, you know, to my almost 30-year-old son, I'm proud of you. And he'll say, I'm proud. And then he'll go ahead and finish it. There's a kind of pride that's good. And Jesus has that kind of pride about his brothers and sisters, about you. Why? Because he suffered with you. He gets it. He's one of us. When I was dating Amy, I told her, I said, you're going to like me so much better when you meet my family. And she, she traveled. Actually, she traveled uh, to, to Lubbock to, to meet my mom and dad and some of my siblings because uh, I was I was I couldn't go at that time um, and to take it to the next level she needed to meet my family and I told her you will like me better and you will not understand me until you meet my family I'm not sure if that was actually the case with Amy but uh, I'm glad she <laughs> said yes You've heard the song by the Hollies. I'll start it and you finish the, the little refrain here. He ain't heavy. Good job. He ain't heavy. Okay, thank you, Bob. He ain't heavy. He's my brother. Maybe you don't know the song. Um, The, the origins of that song go back to like an 1884 uh, a Scottish um, minister writing about the parables of Jesus and he gives a little sermon illustration about a little uh, Scottish girl carrying her baby brother who's enormous and she's walking along with this huge hefty little infant and somebody says aren't you tired isn't he heavy she said he's not heavy he's my brother and it became the, the great song that none of you know <laughs> Neil Diamond does a really good version of it I'm embarrassed to say He became what we are So he can truly help And he claims us As his siblings He's also able to help Because he didn't do what we did You know It's good that Jesus understands But he does more than just understand He showed us the way it's great to have somebody that gets our weaknesses. It's wonderful to find ourselves in group, in group with people that have been through what we've been through. But Jesus hasn't just been through what we've been through. He didn't do what we did. He didn't succumb to the temptations. Too many confession groups and accountability groups meet week after week saying, yeah, me too, yeah. And they get each other, they understand each other, but they don't really provide true help for each other. Sometimes when we think about Jesus and the passage where it says, yet he did not sin, we think, well, then he's not really human. How did he do it? We sometimes equate sinfulness with humanity. You know what I'm talking about. When you make a real mess of things, you find yourself in the pit of your own bad decisions. You say, well, after all, now you probably finished this one. I am, after all, only human. I'm only human, so here we go. C.S. Lewis would say about that huge crutch 
an excuse. Well, actually, maybe you're not quite human enough. Maybe you're not fully human. Because Jesus shows us what true humanity and full humanity is about. He showed us as sons and daughters of God, made in the image of God, what imaging God really looks like. That's true humanity, full humanity, humanity as intended. He didn't do what he did, rather he showed us how we can be truly God imagers. And he did it <coughs> through dependence and reliance, not through pushing some sort of uh, divine God button. He did it as one of us with our capacities and with our abilities. He did it by relying on the Father. Look at Hebrews chapter 5, verse 7 through 9. He didn't do it just by gutting it out, sheer human effort. He did it by relying on God. During the days of Jesus' life on earth, right? You see how earthy this is. He, uh, in fact, the, the real, um, the actual translation is during the days of Jesus' flesh, right? He offered up prayers and petitions with fervent cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. Does this look like a guy who thinks he can do it himself? He's offering up cries and tears to the one who can save him. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Son though he was, he learned obedience through what he suffered and once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. Jesus shows us what true humanity is and it's not just trying harder, it's by dependence and reliance on the Father. He's able to help because he didn't do what he did and he shows us how he pulled it off. He's able to help because he didn't give us what we deserved. Therapy, I, I know it sounds like I've been picking on him. It's good. It's wonderful. All, uh, many, many, many uh, of our professions are good, but they're all limited in their ability to truly help. It can help us feel better about our circumstances and it can help us navigate our circumstances better. But it has its limitations. It can help us to not feel guilty. But only Jesus can actually help us not be guilty. Jesus is the one who actually takes away our sin. He's the one who absolves us of our sin, providing purification once and for all, having set down. And as such, we through him can approach God, not with arrogance, but with confidence. Confidence not in ourselves, but confidence in what he has done for us. He is able to help because he gives us grace and mercy in our time of need. Jesus, our high priest, has dealt with our sin once and for all. He can truly help. And he is able to help because he is what we will be. I want you to think about that one. That one of, of the four things might be the, uh, the least in, intuitive. He is what we will be. Jesus shows us our trajectory. He gives us our hope. He's truly able to help because he shows us where the story's going. He has gone where we are going, both through suffering and to glory. And he has become what we are becoming. Here's the question I want you to think about and wrestle with a little bit. Is Jesus, the Son of God, still human? Is he still human? Certainly, he's, uh, as, I, as I ask that question, I want you to know he's, he's divine, he's God, he's always been God, eternally God. Now, when he was, became fully human, I believe he relinquished, shelved, forewent certain divine privileges, prerogatives, and powers so that he might fully identify with humanity. But it didn't, he didn't cease to be God. The question is, is he still human? Well, I know that you're getting nervous. You're like, oh, preacher's on some thin ice. Eject button, somebody, get the hook. 
I just want to point you to a, a few passages. I don't want to be dogmatic about this, but I do want you to think about this. Why? Not, not as some sort of an academic pursuit, because, but because it provides real hope and real help in our time of need. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. 1 Timothy 2, 5. You'll probably be, some of you will be familiar with this passage. 1 Timothy 2, verse 5. We'll start with verse 3. This is good, and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. It's present tense. There is one mediator, the man, Christ Jesus. Well, what is, what is mediator? That's that high priest idea that he is representing God to the people and representing the people to God. As, huma as human, he can represent humanity to God, and he still is. As God, he can represent divinity to us. Look at 1 John chapter 3, verse 2. 1 John chapter 3, verse 2. This is so powerful and beautiful. Well, it's, it's 1 John chapter 3, verse 2 and 3, but again, with the running start. See what kind of love the Father has given to us, chapter 3 of 1 John, verse 1, that we should be called children of God, and so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him. Because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope purifies himself just as he is pure. He has gone where we are going he has overcome it, and he has cleared the way for us, and he is what we are becoming. The natural son of God has cleared the way for, his, for God's adopted sons and daughters. As one of us, he enters into death, and he goes all the way through it, and he punches the back wall out. I love that image. As one of us, he enters into death, he goes all the way through it, and he punches out the back wall. This is a little bit intense and perhaps a bit too painful to talk about, so I don't want to go into great detail. But some of us know what it's like to be there at the very moment um, that one of our loves want, loved ones is dying. Some of us have been with someone that we love while they're dying. We hold on to them, we talk with them, we pray with them, but at some point they slip away and they go to a place that we can't enter with them at that time. But Jesus can, Jesus can. He's the real friend that has actually gone all the way through the threshold and still lives to help us through it. So, we will not slip away from his grip. We all will face that threshold, but we will not slip away from the grip of Jesus who walks with us even through the shadow of the valley of death because he's been there and he's overcome it and he's punched the back wall out of death and he lives to see us through it too. He can truly help us in our time of need. And guess what? It's our time of need. Now there's going to come a time when, you know, we, we, we don't really think that, that we don't kid ourselves any longer. For all of us, there will come a time when we know all these accumulations and all these possessions, maybe these degrees and accomplishments, we know they're not going to help us right now. Now, we numb ourselves into thinking that all this stuff will help us. 
But only one thing will help us. Jesus, our great high priest. He's, he's all we need. He's all we need. And he's the only one that can truly provide the true help that we need. So, the passage calls on us to draw near to him. We draw near to him with confidence, not on our own. The invitation is this, draw near to him. Draw near to him with confidence, not arrogance. Knowing that he's up there, proud of you, his brothers and his sisters, not ashamed because he's one of you, because he did take on humanity but didn't do what we did, because he offers forgiveness, not what we deserve, and because he is what we will be. He offers true help. Come to him with confidence. Draw near to him while we stand and sing. Nearer, still nearer, close to thy breast. Oh.